I'm, pre- uh, I'm preaching this morning on, uh, on the topic, hope in his peace. Um, I'm going to introduce, uh, give a couple of introduce, introduction paragraphs, then I'm going to pray for us. Um, I feel like uh, there's quite a lot of weight to this. Uh, there's quite a lot of excitement to it as well, actually. Um, and hopefully, a lot of peace to it. Um, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> uh, we live in a time that is marked by strife and discourse. There you go, you see why I'm thinking it's weighty. Uh, the quest for peace remains a universal aspiration that's deeply embedded inside every human being. Yet our understanding of peace often skims the surface of its deeper implications. Within the biblical narrative, there's provided a treasure trove of wisdom regarding peace. Now, in the Hebrew Old Testament, the word shalom is used for peace. You might be familiar with that word. Uh, And in the Greek New Testament, and I'm probably going to pronounce this word wrong as well, uh, irini uh, is the word used in Greek for peace. Uh, At church today, we embark on a journey to uncover the rich, multifaceted nature of peace as presented in scriptures. And we're going to do that by examining its various manifestations in the Old and New Testament, exploring three of its dimensions, namely relational, societal, and personal. And we're going to do this all while confronting the challenge of a lived experiential peace in our daily lives. So before we get into that, can I pray? Um, It'll be really good to. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that your spirit is here in abundance. Thank you that already uh, you've shown signs, examples, given us moments this morning where it's clear you're with us. And so as we open up scripture and as we look at you teaching us from your word, may we humble ourselves before your word. Give us wisdom, uh, give us truth. We don't want as the world gives, we want as you give. And so bless us as we look at your word this morning, in your son's precious name. Amen. The biblical landscape is rich with depictions of peace. Uh, Many times this is displayed in a physical form of peace, but many other times we hear about peace that transcends the physical world. As I said, in the Old Testament, the word shalom is used, and it describes a state of wholeness or completeness where nothing is lacking or broken. The first time we come across the word shalom in the Bible is in Genesis 15, and it's the Abraham narrative. Now, we may know Abraham well, um, but we're going to focus on this section in chapter 15. It says, Then the Lord said to him, or Abraham, Abraham, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in shalom, peace, and be buried in a good old age. Uh, We're mostly familiar with the story of the exodus and captivity, uh, how Moses led God's people out of Egypt. Um, But we want to focus on, before we get there, with shalom, peace in Abraham's death. Abraham, who is known for his faith and his journeys that shaped his life, reached the twilight of his years, rich and full of life. In this text, we find a promise that's given to Abraham, one that carries a deep sense of serenity and completeness. The promise was simple and yet profound. You, however, will go to your ancestors in Shalom and be buried at a good old age. Uh, The word encompasses far more than simply the absence of conflict. It speaks here of wholeness, well-being, and a harmonious end to a chapter of life's story. It assures Abraham that life's concluding with a peaceful transition, a joining with those who have gone before him in a place free from pain and sorrow. As we think of loved ones who have died or near in death, we can let this narrative be a source of solace. Just as Abraham was promised a peaceful departure enveloped in the tranquility of Shalom, we can find solace in the hope that those who trust in Jesus 
will be in that space too. They too have embarked on a journey to eternal peace, a place where worries of this world are no more, where life is lived more fully even than we experience here today. In remembering them, we cherish them. Uh, We remember that they have a peace now that surpasses all understanding, a gentle embrace from God himself. Uh, May we take comfort in the thoughts of the legacy, both in their lived lives and in their memories. May we hold them dear in our thoughts. And may we remember that much like Abraham, they have entered into a timeless embrace of shalom. Now, talking about death can stir up memories and emotions. And so maybe this morning that's starting to stir something in you. Please do speak to people if you are grieving, if you're going through a process of grief. It might have been months or years ago. Uh, Maybe a close friend, maybe an Averso group, maybe one of the pastors here this morning. We want to help you and support you as you move through that. So peace at death is the first time that we see the word used in the Bible. But scripture has a far broader definition than this. In fact, the word can refer to a stone that has a perfectly whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no bricks missing. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness or wholeness. Uh, For example, in the book of Job, uh, his flocks, his household is described as being a state of shalom because there were no sheep missing, no animals missing. Obviously, we know the narrative is more complex than that, but there was a point where that was the description used. Now, it can refer to a person's well-being, like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield and inquired of their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and situations and relationships. And when any of these are out of alignment or missing, something about our shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole, and it needs to be restored. Uh, Talking about David on the battlefield, conflict, fighting, and battles, we know they all remove this sense of shalom. Uh, In Isaiah 9, we read about the undoing of this. Amazingly, uh, every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We are not designed to live in a world at war. We know this in our very core, don't we? And Scripture gives us the most robust framework that any faith or philosophy can give us when we grapple with this disconnect that we experience. Again and again, I read scripture and it precisely and profoundly describes my lived experience. It shouldn't surprise me then when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one source of truth for this world. and We need to hold him out to others. Now, this concept of peace is not confined to the absence of conflicts, as I've said, but extends to the presence of the Holy Spirit's work to bring about fullness and harmony. We observe shalom in action when we see adversaries reconciled, such as Jacob and Esau's heartfelt reunion, or when Joseph graciously forgave his brothers. When rival kingdoms made peace in the Bible, it wasn't just about them stopping the fighting. It was about working together in the aftermath. In the book of Ruth, We see Shalom, where Ruth's loyalty to Naomi brings her out peace and security to her mother-in-law's life. And ultimately, it leads to the restoration of the family line. Incredible. Uh, King David's Psalms frequently invoke the theme of peace as he yearns for God's Shalom amidst turmoil and conflict. Psalm 34, verse 14 is a good example of this. Uh, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's a call to actively pursue peace as a virtue. At Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of peace. Luke chapter 2, I know we're not at Christmas yet. My little fact for the day, I've said this to a few people already. Um, my wife loves Christmas, and uh, 
Two months ago, we were readying ourselves for Christmas. Some of you aren't ready to hear this. Two months ago, we were pretty much in the full swing, right? And two months, the sixth of the year. So we're a sixth of the way already to Christmas. I'm just, I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I just, there we go. Luke chapter two reads, uh, and there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David has been born a savior. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great cloud of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. Jesus emerges as the very embodiment of peace. The Prince of Peace prophesied in Isaiah, His teachings and actions consistently reveal a dedication to cultivating peace in individuals and communities. The Beatitudes extend blessings of peace to those who are meek and pure in heart, promising us comfort and communion with God. His miracles, parables, and personal interactions often culminated in restoration of peace, whether it was calming of storms, healing ailments, or encouraging the downtrodden. On his return to heaven, uh, remember Jesus has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There has always been a beautiful, eternal, peaceful relationship with one another. So they know what they're talking about. Uh, On Jesus' return to heaven, he sent us his Holy Spirit, who is our comforter. The Holy Spirit works within our hearts to bring about peace. The presence of the Holy Spirit is transformative. He guides us and our church community towards a life marked with fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Apostle Paul's letters also contribute to our understanding of peace, as he encourages the Ephesians to maintain the unity through the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He makes every effort, he asks us to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We see here that peace is not just a passive state as I've already mentioned. It's the Holy Spirit enabling us for acts that unite us and reconcile us within the body of Christ. And finally on our whistle-stop tour uh, of peace in the Bible. We end up in Revelation 21. This is maybe one of my uh, treasured sections of scripture looking towards what's to come. And it reads this, then I saw a new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. I'm just gonna pause there. Uh, The eternal space that we go to with God uh, is a new heaven and new earth. And you've heard this and you've read this in scripture. Uh, It's not floating on cloud type moment. Uh, We're inhabiting a new earth uh, and there's gonna be things to do there. Maybe we'll invent things, maybe we'll farm, maybe we'll eat, maybe we'll play sport. We don't know exactly, but it's gonna be an incredible space that we're gonna be in. And that's something to look forward to. A Revelation 21 goes on to say, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
this peace is coming. I want us to spend uh, the final few minutes looking at the three dimensions of peace that I mentioned, uh, relational, societal, and finally, personal. Uh, We can look at the parable of the prodigal son in terms of relational peace. We're very familiar with it, and the narrative itself looks at Father God, uh, and it looks at us as sons, and looks at the way that we've rebelled against God, and God opens his arms to us to welcome us back in. Uh, But there's a simpler way to look at it, and it's a breakdown of a family bond. It's a breakdown there that we read about of a father-son relationship. And I wonder, when we think about that, who here as a father or a parent has felt dishonored, dismissed, or worse by a son or child of your own? Who here has a son or child? Who here, has a, who here as a son or child has dishonored, dismissed, or done worse to your dad or a parent? Things to reflect on. The relational breakdown within the family unit is a real issue in our families. The enemy would love to break down and destroy family units. But relationship breakdown isn't just about parent and child. It can be a spouse, it could be siblings, it could be aunties, it could be other relatives. As we know, relational breakdown isn't just an issue even with our families, but it happens between friends. The relational dimension of peace involves the reconciliation of individuals and the healing of relationships. And it's a recurring theme in Jesus' parables. This will take grace, vulnerability, patience, forgiveness, as things are worked out with one another. But where sin seeks to disintegrate and destroy, peace restores I wonder what family member or individual in your life you might want to pursue peace with today. The societal dimension of peace envisions a community where justice and righteousness are upheld. Uh, We've heard today about IGM and praying for this world. Uh, Maybe that's a group that you want to get involved in. Maybe there's another layer of society that God's calling you to, to be an advocate for his peace but reflecting on ways that we can be his ambassadors for peace in a broken world is something we can all do. And now the personal dimension of peace. Uh, This is depicted in the Bible as an inner calm that endures despite the external chaos that could be in our relationships or in our society. Uh, This peace is rooted in faith and trust in God's sovereignty and is exemplified by Jesus himself, who remained calm, composed, and at peace, even in the face of imminent death. In fact, hours before his own death, a death that he was fully aware of, he speaks to his friends and he says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In these words, Jesus addressed the most intimate fears of those who walked with him. He saw the worry etched on their faces, felt the tremors of their anxious hearts, and with the tender affection of a loving friend, he sought to ease their minds, not just with platitudes, but with a truth that they could hold on to. His message was one of a personal, profound peace, a peace that wasn't so much about the cessation of conflict, although we should live for this, but about calming the inner storms that rage within our souls. Jesus knew that the peace he offered was unlike any found on earth, not rooted in circumstance, but anchored in the divine. How do we know that it's this type of peace he's talking about? In John 16, 33, he makes this even clearer. I have said these things to you so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, we live in a world where we will face trouble. None of us stand up here and try preaching to say that everything's going to be smooth and comfortable 
all your lives. That's not what Jesus teaches. We will find hardship. We will find pain in this world. But we can take heart. We can take heart because we know someone's gone before us and he has overcome this world. And through some divine majesty, through some magnificent grace, through some wisdom which is beyond our understanding, he's asked us to enter in to that peace. And it's the peace that we share with God, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a peace that they've shared for all eternity. We get to step into that relationally. We get to experience that in our lives. We get to live in that peace. I'm really enjoying our hope series. I've been so blessed by Mark and, and Claire, your preaching over the previous weeks. Uh, I've been really challenged and encouraged from scripture. Uh, and I really encouraged a phrase that Mark used early on in the, in the series. Uh, he said, walk through the pain. Don't let the pain walk you. And just in the context of today's talk, hope in his peace, I'd lean on that phrase and I might develop it and say this. As we learn to walk in his abundant gift of peace, the pain and circumstance that seeks to steer our footsteps will have less and less hold on where we tread. I'll say that one more time. As we learn to walk in his abundant gift of peace, the pain and circumstance that seeks to steer our footsteps will have less and less hold on where we tread.